All right, here we go. All right, hi guys, uh, welcome to this video. Basically what we're gonna do today is something between um, a presentation and a sort of podcast. We're basically gonna add sort of visual component to the podcast. And we're going to discuss today um, beyond the 20 rules. So we're going to use mm. um, Piotr Wozniak's very famous article, uh, the 20 rules of uh, knowledge formulation as a sort of backbone and we're going to add in um, some of our own extensions to the 20 rules and we're going to do a little bit of a item review. Uh, we've taken some of the items that we found in our own collections and also from Andy Matushak's Orbit project and we're just going to talk about um, some of the good parts um, and some of the bad parts. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in this uh, kind of content do let us know. Um, one thing that I'm considering doing is having like people send in their items and we can discuss them uh together uh right if people are interested in that sort of thing um but yeah let's get into it and so all right for anyone who doesn't know about what the 20 rules of knowledge formulation are they're essentially a set of very simple um heuristics to guide people to create better space repetition items and they were create this um this guide was created in 1999 by Piotr Wozniak, and it includes things such as don't learn things that you do not understand, learn before you memorize, and so on. Um, I'm expecting that you know, you should probably read this article before you watch this video. But I honestly don't know how you would have found this video if you hadn't already <laughs> uh, stumbled across the 20 <laughs> rules of item for formulation. Anyway, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're new to this and you have not read the article there is so much to gain by reading that it's it's as if you know you can you can skip so much of the line you can you can jump so far ahead just by reading this this article and trying to internalize many of the exactly many of the rules so that's uh that's a really useful thing to start off with and those rules are a really good base but some stuff is not included in there and maybe if you look at it deeply enough everything is included in there because of the generalizability of it but in a certain sense, it it does seem like some stuff is missing also, which is not a fault of Piotr Wozniak. It's just, uh, you know, things change over time and people realize better ways of doing things. So Essentially, anyway. what Zander is saying is this is like a passage from the Bible and we are like biblical scholars <laughs> interpreting an ancient text. <laughs> and perhaps I don't know That's exactly I right. <laughs> we, we are... We are space repetition theologians, which exactly. may come off in the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. I'm not I'm not a scholar who uses space repetition, but okay, anyway. <laughs> so yeah, that's the that's the that's the base of this. And if you have not read that article, please do read it. And this goes beyond that, or at least attempts to. Exactly. Um so the nature of the problem um is that SRS item formulation is firstly very difficult. Uh pretty much everyone who starts using a space repetition system like Anki or Supermemo finds item formulation to be very difficult and the issue is is that um, if you don't have good item formulation you will fail a lot of cards and failing a lot of cards in a space repetition system is extremely painful because the, the cards mm. that you're seeing day to day are those that you struggle with the most and uh, enduring that for a long period of time will just cause like the pleasure of learning to decrease rapidly um, what a lot of people find is that they almost have to treat themselves like an AI for the first two years and just train themselves on <laughs> hundreds of examples of items, you know, trying their own things, trying um, new techniques for creating items. And after maybe two years, three years, perhaps even longer, they finally reach a stage where they've um, found what sort of items work for them. Is that your experience mm. too, Zander? Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly my experience. I think also you, you mentioned that if you make bad items, you fail a lot, which is mm. extraordinarily frustrating. I mean, one of the difficult pieces about SRS is that it's really difficult to take on this habit in the first place. The The habit of reviewing every single day is difficult in and of itself. And then if you compound that with being bad at it, uh, essentially failing at, the, yeah, at your reviews like most of the time or large percentage of the time, that just adds on to the frustration and it just makes it very unlikely that you'll one, gain value from this in any significant sense, and two, stick with it long enough to to make good items in the first place. But also, I, in some way, I think a more troubling failure pattern that goes, it persists for a much longer time, and in some way, it may never truly be rooted out 100%, mm -hmm. is getting the answer right in your space repetition system, 
but it doesn't actually provide you any value in life, exactly. even in the situations that you would think it would, because it's not written in a way where the underlying concept is captured or the underlying meaning is captured, and it, you just memorize it syntactically. So when you see the item, you're sort of memorizing the shape or structure of it, and you can answer it in your space repetition software, but when real life asks that similar problem of you in different words, you can't come up with the answer or the right stuff doesn't trigger in the mind. So in some way, I think that's even worse than failing at the items because at least failing, you know that something new needs to be done. Mm. But if you don't fail, if you get everything right, if you have really high retention and yet it's still not providing you value, like as far as I can tell, one of the two problems has to be either that you're memorizing useless stuff so it's never needed in life or two... It's useful, but you're phrasing it in the wrong way and you're learning it syntactically instead of semantically. So. Exactly. So it's possible to formulate something perfectly, but actually gain no value from it. And that is one of the motivations um, that that uh, sort of thought is one of the motivations for creating this presentation. We actually want to extend beyond the uh, 20 rules of item formulation. So was doesn't right. really talk about um, what things are worth making items from. He's only concerned with formulating knowledge in this document um right so yeah let's get into yeah. the review part of and things. by the way the use of the word presentation there is pretty liberal We're, this is not <laughs> trying to be an ex an exhaustive presentation oh, or yeah. like really formalized advice this is essentially a podcast specifically about formulation and then we also have some slides just to kind of aid with the visuals but it's not like an exhaustive form or uh, exhaustive presentation it's nothing like that but we'll probably do more of these and just talk about different aspects of it so don't don't consider this to be like an exhaustive thing exactly exactly all right um so i suppose we can start looking at the example items now uh so the first yes. one that i pulled out i essentially just um opened up my collection sorted by number of lapses and this one was <laughs> very close to the top. And I think um, it's a very common thing to want to memorize, uh, for, the, uh, for example, the, the date of some important event. So I was mm. really interested in studying about the history of like science and technology, right? And knowing key dates along the way um, throughout that history. And so one of the ones I pulled out was um, when Isaac Newton published um, his uh, Principia and formulated the laws of motion and universal gravitation, right? Um, mm. The thing is, you don't really need to know this sort of fact down to the exact date. Um, I, I think it is much easier to remember, for example, a decade such as the 1680s or even the century, mm. like the 1600s. Um, uh, by doing that, you're creating like much less of a burden on the amount of stuff you need to remember and you probably aren't uh like reducing the actual value you'll gain from such an item mm. yeah i i completely agree with that there's and in some way this is really hard to manage because it's hard to know in advance the importance of something so you right. may only realize the lack of importance of a particular year yeah. somewhere after learning the year specifically mm. like maybe six months later you go oh it would really serve all the same value if I just remember the decade. And as a general principle, the less specific a number is, the easier it is to remember, obviously. So that's uh, it, it's a tough thing, but I definitely agree. A lot of things, the specific year isn't of the most importance, especially if you're talking about something like, you know, a, a timeline of, you know, scientific discoveries, things like this. And uh, exactly. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. There's something very asemantic, something that just causes numbers um, not to stick to your mind. Do you find that? Yeah, I find that. But also, what can help a lot is if... I, I've heard historians mention this in, mm. in different contexts, but if you have a lot of surrounding knowledge mm. about that time period, it makes it a lot more coherent. Mm. And so the years kind of slot in. You know, so it it depends on on your particular context and prior knowledge and this kind of thing. But yeah, as a general rule, uh, numbers are one of the primary things that I lapse on in general. Do you mind if I slip in a little uh, wild card idea right here? Is that okay? Oh yes, please do it. Okay, is that warranted? You know? In a, in a presentation. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I had this idea a while back, right? Because I've known for a while that 
uh, memorizing things like numbers, um, measurements, things that are specifically quantified using a number. It's very difficult right. and asemantic. So one of the right. ideas I had was to, similar to what you just said, you construct, um, you memorize a bunch of uh, sort of similar um, items that give you a sense of scale. Uh, that's like the key term that I came up with. So, for example, if let's just say you were memorizing the sizes of various objects. Um, for example, skyscrapers. You're really interested in skyscrapers. You wanted to memorize the various sizes. So you'd memorize mm. like the size of objects ranging from like the size of like the height of a book. Then you'd go to a house. Mm. Then you'd go to um, <laughs> something larger. Then you'd go to like the largest uh, building in the world and whatever. And you just right. have a sense of scale at each item along the range from smallest to largest. Right. And in different measurements like um, centimeters, millimeters, uh, kilometers and so on. What do you think about that? Mm. I mean, I, I think it could work. I, I don't actually know. I, mm -hmm. I also think a shortcut to that might be just using mnemonics. Mnemonics, this is a situation where a mnemonic could be really valuable. Right. As a general principle, you don't need mnemonics because if the uh, information is coherent, that that serves as the mnemonic itself. You know, meaning is the brain's natural mnemonic. Right. I've heard very smart people say that. Yeah, I, I also <laughs> have uh, quoted that on Twitter, and I heard a very smart person <laughs> say it. So. <laughs> anyway, so that's... But this, a year, or any kind of number, is a situation in which a mnemonic would actually be sensible to use. So mnemonics are, are valuable in that way. And it could be kind of a cheat code. Like, if, if you have no coherence around the number itself, and you just want to force it, a mnemonic can be really cheap way to do that so your idea may work it just seems sort of costly and i actually don't know if it would work how long do you think it would take i'm not sure i'm honestly not sure it seems like um I'm, i wonder with the history example were you referring to something specific like i've seen some uh pdf posted i, I feel like we talked I, about yeah this. i bet i bet you know what i was thinking of but yeah. I, I was also thinking of other examples but the example you're thinking of if i if i'm guessing it correctly yeah. is that example where uh, the person was talking about once you reach some kind of critical mass yes. of historical knowledge, yeah. everything sort of slots in and makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful quote. I wish I uh, wish I had it on hand. I, I think it's. Great. I think it's Barry Mazur. I will find it and put it in the description of this video. Oh, excellent! Um, but he was talking nice. about uh, like someone he knew who was studying European history, and they said that once they'd reached a certain critical mass of knowledge in European history, that it entirely changed mm. their view on the subject. So what I'm imagining right. in my head is that that person has developed um, simply by just being immersed in that field for so long. They've developed their own sense of scale. They'll know all the dates and um, you know all the decades and the important events where they were located in space and time. You know, um, right? Exactly. Yeah. So perhaps just developing. Yeah, it. and it's it. Oh yeah, yeah. I I completely agree. And it it happens naturally too. Like yeah. if you're if you're really interested in a particular person's life, and you like read a biography of them, mm. all of the years start to make more sense by the end because everything you have so many touch points. Like they did this in that year and this in that year, so everything starts to make more sense. And uh, yeah, it's just a natural process. But again, if you wanna if you wanna get past all that, uh, a mnemonic would probably be sensible to use. Oh, and also, if I could critique this item additionally to that, Absolutely. I hope you don't go mind. Ahead. Go ahead. I think you could remove a lot of these words. Ooh, Basically, yes. what this item is asking is, what year did Newton release this? Yes. And you could remove you could remove all the things that it's about, and you could have another item about that stuff, because you're not going to remember that from this item anyway. It's probably fine, but if you wanted, you could remove all that extra stuff. Exactly. It's kind of... It it almost comes down to the question of like, is it worth the time to take it away in a sense? Like, right. Since right. as long as it's not interfering with, um, it's not causing some sort of uh, interference with another item, then you might just leave it in a less, like a less than perfectly formulated state, you know? Yeah, it, it all depends on priority and it depends on experience as well. For example, yeah. if you have a lot of experience, you may notice like, like I mentioned, you learn the shape of something. So removing unnecessary wording can reduce that problem. I think shorter items generally are less pattern matched or um, pattern extracted, I think is a phrase that Piotr Wozniak uses in some cases here. But anyway, so there's some, there's some experience and 
context-related things and priority-related things. But definitely, if you wanted to and you had the time, you could uh, get rid of some of the extra stuff there. Yes, yes, exactly. So um, I've also included a picture of the repetition history. And I'll be honest, I don't know what all of these numbers mean. But <laughs> if you look at... Um, I will highlight it on the screen. If you look, uh, you can see where I started, um, where I did the first repetition date on March the 4th, 2019. It says first. And you can see that very shortly after creating this item, I failed it uh, the second time I saw it after creating it and then uh, got it right, then failed it two times in a row and so on. And I think that um, when you see that you failed something very soon after uh, creating it, that's like a massive warning sign that something has gone hideously wrong. I think it's very rare mm. that once you get past the, well, actually, I can't say this for certain. You you probably have more information than me on this because you've been using it for longer. You know, once mm. you get past, let's say, the fourth repetition or third or fourth repetition, uh, do you find that it's common that you start failing after that? No. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not. If you if you make it, especially with the long intervals that SM has, like if you make it past, you know, an interval of 150 days or so, I, I would say that pretty, pretty clearly resembles or pretty clearly represents the fact that you, you know, know it pretty well and it's pretty coherent. Of course, it's not always true, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. And this just comes back down to the one of the simplest of was his heuristics, just like learn before you memorize. If you fail immediately after creating the item you probably shouldn't have created the item because mm. you create the item to uh to maintain knowledge that you've already gained not to gain knowledge um in right. a sense yeah exactly all right and also it's worth noting like <laughs> if you fail an item a lot at some point you have to ask yourself is it worth it yes to keep this because of the extra reps it will take not here's the thing if, unless you're in school and you're being forced to do this, you're learning stuff for the pleasure of it mm. and for the utility of it. And if you're constantly forgetting something, maybe it's not worth it. Because, like, with all these reps, if you assume that every rep takes five seconds, you know, James would have already spent a couple of minutes on this item. Mm. So, you know, it may not be worth it. And if you have a lot of leeches, it, it can really ruin the process. It can become a very joyless thing where you're constantly going, oh, this item again. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. And it just ruins the whole fun of the process. So, you know, also, if, if something is uh, a leech, just remove it, maybe. Maybe it's not worth it. Yeah, exactly. Um, sort of a good, uh, like a good way of putting it is that you spend 80% of your time on 20% of your items. And those items right. are the leeches. It's just like, uh, right. you know, wealth disparity. It's just like, um, like a power law distribution. Right. right? Yeah. 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 Um, all right, let's go on to the next one. All right. Um, so this one uh, is an example of an item that has sort of an ambiguous answer. It has um, W.D. Hamilton and Robert Trivers in the answer. And the one, <laughs> the thing that makes this especially confusing to someone who's been studying um, like evolutionary biology or something like that is that I think the, I'm even having trouble <laughs> remembering it now after having uh, screenshotted this item and made sure I knew I was talking about. <laughs> um, I think Robert Trivers was uh, a student of W.D. Hamilton. I think I have that encoded as an item because it interested me. And like they'd been, um, you know, W.D. Hamilton had come up with this theory. Robert Trivers had ex extended it. But it just creates so much interference between the two of them. Now I, I can't even really say for certain which one of them came up with which theory, which one of them is the student, which one is the, uh, you know, the uh, <laughs> postdoc advisor or whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> you just gonna... Yeah. Well, I'll just say from my memory, that is the correct, you, you got it correct. Okay. That Trivers is a student of Hamilton. So, uh, but yeah, I can definitely see how there would be interference there. Yeah. 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 So would you, do you have any suggested improvements to this to, to avoid that inf interference? Um... That's a good question. Maybe to, uh, since all the items I have, they're always encoding a similarity between W.D. Hamilton and Robert Trivers. You know, maybe it'd be good to mm. find some dissimilarities or some other relation between them. 
you know something to right. uh i don't know i don't know the mechanism of interference like what what how you know what causes two items to interfere with each other you know uh what do you think mm. yeah it's very uh it's very strange um I remember I had this item about two two U.S. presidents, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, mm-hmm. died on the exact same day, which was July 4th, 1826, which was exactly 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Okay, okay. Right? And so that's just like an interesting fact. Uh-huh. And I had always gotten it wrong about who died first, mm. you know, because they died on the same day. Right. Then once I was listening to this history lecture, and this guy mentioned that John Adams one of his final words was Thomas Jefferson lives. And this guy noted, I, this guy noted that he was actually wrong. And Thomas Jefferson had died a few hours before that. Ah. And ever since I watched that clip, it like totally removed all the interference for me. And I, I just remember that. And I go, Oh yeah, John Adams was wrong. And Thomas Jefferson had died. So I, it's something like that. You need like some sort of clarification yeah. that makes it clear that the interference that you're having couldn't possibly occur so maybe like you said a point of disagreement or some some kind of difference between them something like that where it's clear when you have an item like oh it couldn't have been this guy because he believes this or he thinks this way or whatever it is you know that's very interesting that is very interesting um yeah it sucks because you can't plan those moments i certainly didn't plan that it was just like a serendipitous exposure to some sort of (laughs) interference resolution so yeah it's like uh you were presented a fact that made any um any confusion about uh you know who died first uh impossible to get wrong because right yeah, yes yeah so you somehow need to trigger <laughs> that if you have an instance of interference you need to uh resolve it by finding some fact that um shows you unambiguously that it cannot be the case in one way it has to be this this way right yeah yeah, in, I guess it all boils down to just improved coherence of the whole structure. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if I got it wrong? <laughs> it's actually the, the opposite. Well, then you'd have to, um, oh. you, maybe you could take, uh, you could download the YouTube video, right? You take an extract yes. of the audio and you include that in the answer. You know, impossible. For Wonderful. To there you go. Exactly. That, that You know, that's a great idea. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll definitely do that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right forwards and onwards ah yes finally a good one or at least uh, <laughs> i think it's good <laughs> uh this one is from douglas hofstadter uh yep yeah. yeah and he said um russell believed that what about a mathematical system was like a kiss of death and the answer is self-reference or it being able to talk about itself and i love this item mm. it basically came pre-formulated for me by douglas hofstadter mm and oh wonderful yeah he obviously as we've been discussing at lengths uh privately in the discord <laughs> as well as on the last podcast golden nuggets podcast episode 10 go and watch it right now um yes douglas hofstadter he believes very strongly in the power of analogy he he uh, did this mm. amazing lecture that we really enjoyed called analogy as the core of cognition i'll leave a link in mm. the description and he's basically talking about exactly that, how analogy is just everything. It's fundamental to the way we think and how brains work. And that has prompted a lot of discussion amongst us and other people in the Discord about, you know, encoding analogies, similes, those sort of things, making relations between um, different kinds of systems, um, encoding those as items, and whether that's valuable uh In my experience so far, I have found encoding analogies like this super useful. Like, I I don't think I have any lapses on any of the... In fact, yeah, I included the repetition history. At least so far, no lapses. And I have a bunch of similar items where I've done uh, analogies between different systems. And they all seem to have Mm. very good performance in terms of... um, In the space repetition system. Is that your experience? Yeah, analogies are, are wonderful, man. Not only do they help with memory, but they help with your understanding. And mm. they uh, they go beyond that. And they, like I was mentioning, when your items don't activate at the proper time, I really think it helps your brain interpret the underlying meaning mm. of the information. 
such that it activates at the appropriate time. I touched on this in the podcast, but I think that's such an important point. I think technically in, in cognitive science, they, they call it like spreading activation or something like this. I, I'm not really familiar, but I think these analogies, you know, it's that phrase, repeated analogies expand concepts. Mm. And by expanding that concept, one of the side effects or maybe a primary effect of that is this increase in spreading activation to, you know, semantically similar things so that in your in the course of your daily life, this item will activate when it should, when there's something similar to this. Exactly. Exactly. So. All right. Yeah, that's excellent. A reminder to go and check out uh, Golden Nuggets podcast, episode 10. I'll leave the link in the description. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we actually did cover this, so it would be useful to listen to. Right. But anyway, all right. On to yours. I think we're moving on to some of the items that I included here. By the way, I just want to say thank you very much for Andy Matushak's diligent work on the design of Orbit so that I could <laughs> shamelessly steal the color scheme and fonts because uh, now my items in Superman will look beautiful. So there we go. They do look very, very nice. Anyway... <laughs> So each of these items, it just sort of represents a different pattern that I think might be useful. Again, this is not exhaustive. It's just a couple examples of patterns that you can use in items, kind of like a template. Just uh, use these patterns, and or at least I use these patterns and find them very valuable. Mm -hmm. So the first one is when you need to remember a list, you know, because a lot of people go, oh, you never need to remember a list. Well, it's not true. There's often times when it would be nice, like if someone said to me, oh, what does Waz say about you know, incre uh, decreasing the amount of sleep you need, right? Mm. I would like to be able to recall at least one thing that he recommends, yeah, yeah, right? Because that's very useful. Sleep is an important thing to me. So to me, this is worth making an item out of. And if you want to remember a list, which I do recommend in a lot of circumstances, this pattern of requiring yourself to name at least one or name at least two, it depends mm. how many items are in the list and how familiar you are with the thing and also how important it is. If it's really important, you may want to remember all of it and you... In addition to an item like this, you can also have closes for each of the items in the list so that you can remember them individually. Again, it just depends on the importance and the coherence and the context. So anyway, this one is just uh, what is a healthy option for decreasing the amount of sleep you need? Name at least one. And the two options, follow your circadian cycle, take well-timed naps. I have independent items that support conceptually why those things are true. Oh, you know, when you follow your circadian cycle, those those that sleep is more efficient, so you require less of it. You know, these kinds of things. And, um, yeah, I just think this is a good pattern for remembering lists, just requiring yourself to name some number of them. And, uh, and yeah, I, I find these kinds of items to be hugely valuable. Do you have any items like these, James? Um, I don't think... I don't think I state explicitly name at least one, and I think I should, because if you don't, mm. then you leave it uh, sort of ambiguous as to whether you should fail the item if you name uh an example that isn't in the list if you know what i mean right right uh, exactly yeah yes. that isn't the answer yeah uh so i think this is a very good pattern and i love what you said about creating items that support um conceptually each uh uh answer in the list right yeah each list item yeah i i think that's critically important because that's that's a huge part of why i'm able to remember this list in the first place mm. because i have that conceptual framework that's propped up by these other items in the mind. And also the the utility of that name at least one right there, you might say, oh, well, I know that when I have a list like this, I only require myself to name such and such. Mm. But one, it's going to vary. The number of them is going to vary, like I said, based on importance and mm. prior knowledge and things like this. And also you're just going to forget that over time. You're not going to know whether it's important enough to remember every item. So, and, and space repetition it largely relies on activating the same brain state at every repetition. Yes. So when you have this, it's just another clarification piece for yourself to get to the exact same brain state so that it's more effective. So I think that's a very useful pattern and uh, one that I've seen people like Andy Matushak use and uh, maybe maybe Waz has employed it as well, but I think it's a very useful pattern. So that's that one. Yeah, that's a great point. Like when you... Uh, um when you are doing your items you want the uh sort of electrical activity to flow exactly the same way across your neurons you know right. you don't want any variance right. yeah. so you don't want any ambiguity that's right uh because otherwise it will yes, undermine I, I, that's the... so important yes yeah it's so important 
All right. All right. So the next one here. This one includes two patterns that I like a lot. One is the use of the word might, mm. which seems kind of trivial. But I'm telling you, if you try this out, it just changes the way you think about the information that can feasibly represented in an atomic item. It, you just, I don't know, it opens your mind in some kind of way. It's like a, like a, a, a bit of a tool. So mm. the word might is very, very useful, and I employ that a lot. And then also this phrase, first principles. I, I like this phrase for encoding reasoning steps. Like, y y there are a lot of ways you could phrase this item. Like, what I'm trying to get at is the reason that intuitive judgments about certain things like social interactions are more reliable is because natural selection honed it such that, you know, if you couldn't pick up on certain cues, you were less likely to be integrated, less likely to be reproduced, these kinds of things, right? So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do is capture that line of reasoning. And when I say what might be a good first principles, first principles there is just cluing me in, like, don't assume a bunch of other stuff. Just just take what we really, really know, the first principles reasoning, mm -hmm. and just trying to get to, okay, I can trust my intuitive judgments about social things, right? Very, very good. And so this item actually feels really obvious to me now. And I can't tell why that is, whether it's because of the item itself or maybe I just already knew a lot about this kind of thing and that's why I was able to formulate this item in the first place. It's hard to tell. But anyway, the first principles phrase can kind of unlock the way of thinking about it in terms of the reasoning itself and not just so much like, here's the fact and I'm trying to get you to recall the fact. It's more about the the reasoning, and that mm. that phrase unlocks that for me. Very very interesting. Actually, this is kind of a superficial comment, but I seem to remember one of my very favorite public intellectuals, um, Nassim Taleb, saying a very similar thing. <laughs> actually, uh, saying that uh, time can act as a filter on uh, on ideas, so you know you can trust those ideas that have been around for a long time. How do you feel about that? Mm. <laughs> I think that's great. He's a he's a very bright man, and I would never say a bad word about him. <laughs> very, very good. Very, very good. Um, one more thing, I'll just say I I love the idea of it, um being able to encode tentative knowledge. You know, knowledge that yes might not be correct, but for the purpose of right. this um item, we can treat you know we can treat it as a generalization, and we can just uh you know don't think too hard about it, like you just said, and um yeah just use your instinctive judgment exactly right the word might i'm telling you this is a this is a major key here this really unlocks a lot because a lot of times you want to encode some information but it may not be like the one true answer yeah. to this it's just one that you know and you it's not like you know everything yeah but it's just one that you know so using this word might it allows you to kind of frame things tentatively, even though they're not. I mean, I believe this is technically correct from an evolutionary biology perspective. So right. even though I believe this is correct, the use of the word might just puts me in a different brain state and it helps me helps me reason about it better. And, and maybe I'm not seeing things clearly on that sense, but I really do feel like the word might is valuable. I absolutely agree with you. And at least from, I, I remember we we actually checked our collections, right, to, to see how these might items had performed across our collections. Right. And as far as I remember, right. you know, with the data we've collected so far, they performed very well, very similar to the analogy items. Very few lapses. I think very well. I only had one yes. lapse across um, those items. I think you had none at all. So <laughs> very good performance. Yeah, as I recall, I had none at all, yeah. yeah. So, and of course, we may be inverting the, the causal relationship there, who knows, but I yeah. actually do believe these are valuable, so... Anyway, uh, I, think it's, I think we can move on to the next one here. Uh, oh, yes, this is one from Andy. So this is from the How to Write Good Prompts article, and I just went through it before this mm. on, a, on a fresh web browser so I could get some of the prompts. But anyway, I, this, I like this example a lot because it's a place where I think closes are actually useful. So many people, and this is without disrespect, they make the worst closes that are just awful and not really encoding any understanding or, or long-term value. So I, I don't think many of them are valuable. But anyway, this example really is a good use of a close in my view. Because look at this, dude. Imagine trying to phrase this in a way that wasn't a close. Mm. If, you, if, if that yellow highlighted word there, if you had to come up with that answer in a way that wasn't a close, it would just be kind of convoluted. I feel like it wouldn't access it as directly 
And here, I just feel like this is a true good use of the of the clothes because it's just it's a, it's in the phrasing. It's something about the phrasing that connects the whole thing. Yeah. And the meaning of this is really clear to me. And I've actually thought of this item in my day to day life. This is one of the reasons why I believe that it's valuable. So I I think this is a really good example of a close because it it connects the phrasing, the particular phrasing there to the meaning and it's not too convoluted in a way that it would be if you tried to convert this to like a q a item you know what i mean i know exactly what you mean I, I i really like this item and i think the key for it comes down to the part after the colon because i kind of imagine um sort of a beginner srs user just creating the item writing good prompts often involves and then just closing interpretation and not having right. that part after the colon that for me is, is key right. because it it um, gives you a definition, of, a very concise definition of interpretation. And that gives you all the information you need to, uh, you know, sort of hint at the answer. And right. it's super useful. Yeah, this is a great item. Yeah, it, it removes all the ambiguity. That that part after the column removes all the ambiguity. Yeah, so yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. And people, you often see people in the beginning making closes, like you say, and they're just full of ambiguity. Like yeah. it doesn't make any sense. The close could have... A dozen answers to it, yeah. you know, and, it's, and this is a, it's just such a good example to me because it's a it's a great use of a close. It's it's not many closes are unnecessary. You could easily formulate them and have a better result with a Q and A, but this it's it matches the phrasing to the meaning. It removes all the ambiguity. It it lines it up perfectly with the surrounding context of the article and the other prompts. I just I I think this is a wonderful close, and I think that's a good pattern. I. I have a hard time giving any hard and fast rules, but just soak this up in your mind, let your neural networks figure it out, and maybe you'll have a, a better time. Exactly. Very nice. <laughs> All right. So that's that one. The next one. Oh, yes. I like this one. Here we go. This is like a, this is an example. So again, if we, if we go back to that phrase, repeated analogies expand concepts. Mm -hmm. The concept here, and I'm going to be loose with this and just say the concept is a focus prompt you know what is a focus prompt this is the concept of play and just just roll with it here it may not actually be technically true but if that's the concept and we're having an example of that concept the example acts as an analogy and that analogy expands this concept so by identifying what particular aspect of this prompt makes it focused it just really integrates the meaning of what a focus prompt is. Mm. So I, I consider these example items like what is this or why does this act as this or what makes this like this or something like that. These examples can really, really help and, and pull things into focus and uh, and just integrate the meaning of it. Yeah, I agree. I think this item would really help you uh, understand, you know, uh, what good items are, uh, what's good about right. good yes. items. So I definitely yeah, agree. and the, I guess the general pattern at play here, if you're looking for a takeaway, is like if you have some concept that that has some implication about things that that are going to be created or things that you're going to do or whatever, just make an example of it and then identify some aspect or you know figure out why this is like that or why it fits into this category and not that category or what distinguishes it. You know these kinds of things. Mm. I think that general pattern is really useful. Okay, okay. So, all right, there's that. The next one here. Here we go. This is a, I guess you would call it an application prompt where you're right. pulling together I, many ideas that you've learned to produce. Well, you could say there's only one idea here, but let's just say there's many ideas about, you know, what makes a good prompt, and phrasing, and things like this. So you're pulling together all this knowledge to create a new entity you're actually generating something new and I think these kind of generation items there's another prompt in this orbit set actually about what knowledge is refreshed by like generative creative prompts mm -hmm. and basically the answer is all the knowledge or or concepts that you use every time you generate an example so mm -hmm. I think that's a really useful thing and these these kind of generation or application prompts are really really valuable and if you can find some sort of micro uh, micro aspect of something you're learning where you can generate an example this can be a really valuable prompt it, it can produce 
so much new capability because you're theoretically you would come up with a new one or a slight variation every time and this may not be the best example of that there are ones where he explicitly says you know use a new one if you can okay this kind of thing so okay anyway i think that general pattern of of you know putting together your current understanding of some topic and then generating a new thing based on that but it's very micro this is very quick it's not like this is an onerous you know problem solving prompt or something like yeah, this yeah okay so I, I think that's a really good uh really good pattern yeah i mean for me i'm less certain of it i think what you just said there was very important that it's something very quick it's a, at least trying to be sort of atomic um i often find that people try to put in like math problems into a space repetition system and it just doesn't work because right. you're spending like like doing a whole problem that takes like five minutes it, there's something about the um the, the fineness if you know what i mean the fineness of the algorithm right. how delicate it is right. that just doesn't work for these sort of bulky problems um i don't know of a better way to put it than that but uh it just seems to me that larger problems uh procedural tasks they seem to require a different sort of algorithm to atomic items would you agree with that oh completely agree with that mm -hmm. and in a lot of ways it makes perfect sense because how does the algorithm know what aspect of it you forgot yes, so because yeah. it can't independently schedule the aspects if you get any of it wrong you may you may remember nine out of ten components but then that one leads you to get the answer wrong so the whole item is wrong and now the whole scheduling is off and it feels weird because you understand one component of it so poorly and the rest so well yeah and it's just the whole balance of it is off i i don't think the memories work the same because yes. you're you're activating the memories in an inconsistent way it's not uniform right and yeah it, there's a whole host of problems with it if you are going to do that also just for the time of it i would separate it out from your other reviews because it can be so like like for example if you have to get out pen and paper to solve like a math problem mm. in between answering basic questions about history or whatever else mm -hmm. it's gonna be so taxing yeah, and be so you're just not gonna want to <laughs> yeah you're not gonna want to do your reviews at all so if you're gonna do something like that uh create a separate in, in super normal terms create a separate collection or yeah in anki terms create a separate deck or whatever it is and uh, also, it may affect the, the intervals of your other items if the algorithm you're using is adaptive to the collection, which the latest SuperMemo algorithm is. So anyway, yeah, there's a ton of problems with it. And in an ideal sense, you should break up all the, the hefty problems into micro problems and solve those. And the hope is that you have some items that connect the meaning of one to the meaning of another, and then the whole structure emerges. And when you're presented with the problem, you can solve it, right? But I'm, I'm not as hopeful about that. It depends on the context. And maybe for some people, it's worth it to do like very onerous taxing mathematical items, things like this. But again, it, it really depends on context. And I would avoid that if you could. All right. That sounds very good. All right. Do you want to... Wonderful. Uh, the final thing, really, that I wanted to talk about was... Um two things or really one thing that uh mm. is sort of missing from the 20 rules of formulation and that is the importance of applicability and having like a meaningful goal when you're learning with a space repetition system um so you've written an article about the importance of applicability right um mm. yes what are your thoughts on you know how important it is to have something meaningful that mm. you're working towards rather than just uh learning meaningless uh trivia <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a couple different angles i could take on it the article i wrote is about the importance of applicability for easy formulation mm -hmm. because if you don't if you don't know where information is going to be useful it's hard to frame it in ways where the item makes sense and is good so you could look at it like that if, if information is really applicable it's much, much easier to formulate mm. in a way that will be durable. So that's a that's a really important aspect. But probably even more important than that is like, what is the point of learning all kinds of trivia? It's not going to add up to anything. And here's what happens, right? The hope that people have, mm -hmm. at least as far as I can observe, is you 
fill your brain with a bunch of disparate information just based on pure interest, right? And I'm not saying it's bad to learn trivia or things like this. You mm-hmm. can if you want, but like a lot of things about the world are interesting, but not a lot of things are really useful to to each person. So you fill your brain with a bunch of trivia for years and then it doesn't really add up to anything significant. Uh-huh. And so the impact there is your morale really takes a hit. Yeah. And so over time, you end up learning less because you go, oh, well, this is not really adding up to anything. I'm not really using this knowledge. I don't really have any significant skills that I didn't have before. So why would I keep dumping all this time into this? And I think that's a huge aspect of it. It's just much more valuable and meaningful and, I don't know, just long-term worthwhile if you focus on things that would actually make a difference in your life. Exactly. I completely agree. I think um, Andy has a very good note on this, that, you know, uh, the, the whole culture of space repetition systems is fixated on meaningless goals. I think it's a real problem right. in right. the space repetition community. You know, uh, we need more people focusing on using space repetition to write a book, do academic research, do independent research, just uh, start a business, right. you know, create program projects or whatever. That's creative um, pursuits are the frontier of space repetition. Um, you know, focus on that rather than learning <laughs> pub quiz trivia knowledge. Uh, right, exactly. It's like an intellectual party trick. Yes. It's like, I think, and I hope I'm not being disrespectful to people here, but it seems like a lot of people do this because they want people to think they're smart, mm. which is fine. I understand that impulse, I suppose. But trust me, people will think you're smarter if you do something useful instead of knowing all the countries of the world. That's not going to affect your life. Yeah, yeah. And like, seriously, it doesn't matter. And just just focus on things where if you knew it, you would get value from it. Not, oh, maybe one time if this particular situation happens to me that's very unlikely to ever occur in real life, I would know the answer to that because I have this item now. It's like, ah, oh, okay, well, is it really worth it? Probably not. Exactly. And finally, you know, knowledge valuation. How do we uh, decide what is worth uh, encoding as SRS items? How do we distinguish mm. the copper nuggets from the golden nuggets? Mm. <laughs> I think for me, a lot of this comes over time of just learning a bunch of stuff and then realizing, oh, I didn't even use that once. Uh-huh. And then you would start to build sort of a generalized concept of what something looks like if it's useful. You know, what the feeling of understand, understanding something that integrates with the whole mm. in a way that is valuable. That's a distinctive feeling. So if you if you tap into that, listen to yourself over time, I think that's a really good way of doing it. And also just get rid of these goals of like trying to remember a whole book. Mm. It's total nonsense. Yeah. It's total nonsense. Yeah. And if especially if you go into it, if you go into learning everything with a micro goal, I'm reading this book because I expect it to increase my understanding of this topic, mm-hmm. right? Then every time what you're essentially doing is saying, If I were to remember this, would this get me closer to my goal of understanding this topic? Mm. And so you can compare it like that. And that's why these meaningful goals can be really clarifying in terms of what you remember and what you don't and and what you spend time on and what you don't. Yeah. For me, really, step one is to have a meaningful goal. Then you can value uh, things uh, in a way consistent with your overarching goal. Um, there's right. always going to be uncertainty about what uh, what specific things are going to be the most useful to you in your lifetime, obviously, because you can't really predict um, what things are going to be uh, valuable in the future, what things will lead to creative associations and um, ideas right. uh, that will allow you to create amazing things. Um, but one thing that's been on my mind that you can do is perhaps you can look at um, over time uh in human history are there any people who have similar goals to you what did they do to acquire knowledge what fields were they learning and um you know what were the ideas that allowed them to be uh extremely successful and can you um try and learn those ideas and become successful in the future as well right 
Yes, exactly. I I think that's a really useful pattern, which is why reading biographies can be a really um, worthwhile and valuable thing to do. Yep, absolutely. So. All right. So. All right. I think that's it for today. Um, I really hope you enjoyed this style of video. Uh, we're super nerdy about <laughs> um, item formulation <laughs> and this sort of stuff. So <laughs> if you do enjoy it, you'll get a whole bombardment of uh, new videos from us because we love doing this. Um, if you Absolutely. would like to have your items reviewed, if that sounds interesting to you, then feel free to send them in. You can uh, send it to us on mm. Twitter or something or on Discord. We'll leave our Twitter in the description. Um, again, I hope you enjoyed this video. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.